So a couple weeks ago, Nina Martinez became the first person living with HIV to donate a kidney. This is a milestone celebration, not, of, not only of the advances in treatment of HIV, but also in the destigmatization of this condition. Back when I was in medical school, the concept of somebody with HIV becoming an organ donor was absolutely outlandish. But today, it's possible. What I want to talk to you about today is, in the spirit of connecting the dots, all of the things that had to come together over time for this to be possible today, including improvement in the care of patients living with HIV, lessons from transplanting people with HIV, inspiration from a particular favorite badass friend of mine in South Africa, research related to policy, an effort on Capitol Hill, an NIH-funded national clinical trial, research in HIV and kidney disease, and then a healthy dose of American altruism. So, in the 1980s, HIV AIDS was a death sentence. Today, it's a completely different story. Today, with this condition, and I won't even call it a disease, with this condition, you take one pill, you control your viral load. If we check your blood, we can't even see HIV in it, and you live a normal life. We have a little bit of challenges with drug resistance, so as we get smarter, the HIV gets smarter, and we have to make new drugs. But today, basically, there isn't a single strain of HIV out there that we can't treat with the medications that we have today. What that means is that people with HIV live normal lengths of lives. They live the same life expectancy as people who don't have HIV. They get the same diseases as people who don't have HIV, including diabetes and high blood pressure and the things that cause kidney disease. There are 600,000 people in the United States living with kidney failure, and a good proportion of them have HIV. Now, if you have HIV and you have kidney failure, so you're on dialysis, you don't do as well as your HIV-negative counterparts do, all the more making it important for us to try to get these patients transplanted. This is Peter Stock. He's a transplant surgeon from San Francisco who about 20 years ago said, we need to transplant people with HIV. But there were concerns because well, what about the immune system? We have to give people immunosuppression so that they don't reject organs. And so the immunosuppression, is that going to really ruin the immune system? And then they're going to get infections, and they're going to have all sorts of problems. Peter said, we can figure this out. Well, what about drug interactions? What about interactions between the transplant medications, the HIV medications, et cetera? Peter said, we can figure this out. And they did, and they got funding, and they did a national study and they showed that it's safe to take people with this condition and transplant them. Because it turns out that they are not immunosuppressed. If you have HIV and you're well controlled, you're just like anybody else who gets transplanted who doesn't have HIV. In fact, the biggest challenge early on with transplanting people with HIV was the same challenge that I had to struggle with in high school, that of rejection. So, <laughs> The rejection rate was three times higher in people with HIV. Why? Because we were afraid to give them immunosuppression. We were afraid that their immune system was already too weak. It turns out that's not the case at all. Their immune system is like everybody else's. So what we learned from Peter Stock and his vision is that we can transplant people who have HIV. Elmi Mueller is a transplant surgeon in Cape Town, South Africa, where things were a little bit different. In Cape Town, in South Africa, if you have kidney failure, it's not like if you have kidney failure in the U.S. In the U.S., if you have kidney failure, you go on dialysis. In South Africa, if you have kidney failure, unless you have a lot of money, you die, because there's no availability of dialysis across the board like we have here in the U.S. So here she is watching people with kidney failure dying and then seeing a potential source of organs from them 
among people living with HIV. The prevalence of HIV in South Africa is much higher than it is in the US. So a lot of the potential donors had HIV. One day she said, I'm sick of throwing away these organs. These will work fine for people living with HIV. Let's transplant them. Well, this was very visionary. Nobody had ever done this in the world. And it pissed off a lot of people. The medical board tried to take her license away. The hospital tried to fire her. They tried to arrest her. This did not go well, but she persisted and eventually published the first few patients in the New England Journal of Medicine and proved to the world that this was a safe thing to do and inspired a lot of us to want to do the same thing. And for me, I was a junior transplant surgeon, and I said, we should be doing this in the US. We have a lot of people on our waiting list who have HIV. I'm watching them die. I'm throwing away organs from people who have HIV who could have been donors. Why not do it here? Well, it turns out that the congressional law, the law overseeing organ transplantation in the US, was written in the 1980s. What was HIV like in the 1980s? It was a death sentence. So it made sense that we put a thing in the law that said we shouldn't use organs from donors who have HIV. But that was not the case 10 years ago when I started this mission. So in order to make this possible, we would need an act of Congress, literally. Brian Boyarsky had just graduated from this esteemed University of Johns Hopkins and was interested in policy things and came to work in my research group. And I said, well, if you want to take on a policy project, I'll tell you, there's one thing that's really been pissing me off. We throw away a lot of HIV positive organs. We could be saving lives with them. How would you like to take on Congress? And Brian said, that sounds fun. And I said, you are exactly crazy enough to go on this mission with me. So one of the things we had to do was we had to figure out what would be the impact of this, right? You know who runs this country. It's 23-year-old legislative assistants inside the Beltway. We would have to convince them that this was important enough to put their energy behind. Because every year, about 7,000 bills get introduced, and only 50 or 60 that year ever got passed. So we would have to convince people of that. And the first thing we needed to be able to tell them is, how many potential donors are there? How many lives would be saved? And what would it cost? Because every bill gets a congressional budget office score, right? The problem is we had no idea. Okay, one of my jobs is a big data scientist. As a big data scientist, we take data that were collected for completely different reasons, and we use them to answer questions that are important to our field. And one of them was, how many potential HIV-positive donors would there be? Well, what does it take to be an HIV-positive deceased donor? You have to be deceased, and you have to have HIV. And you have to have died in a hospital. That's the way we do the donor system in this country. So we looked at hospital admission records across the country. There is a registry of hospital admissions where we could look at the diagnosis codes, make sure that they had HIV and didn't have kidney failure, liver failure, et cetera, make sure that they died in the hospital, and look at their age and other demographics, et cetera, and figure out from that how many people we thought could potentially be organ donors. We took that and then applied it to the national transplant data to figure out how many organs would be used from them, how many lives would be saved, and then we could figure out what this would cost the healthcare system. Do you know how much it costs the healthcare system every time we do a kidney transplant? About negative half a million dollars. Why is that? Because otherwise they have to pay for dialysis, and dialysis is really expensive, and it turns out a kidney transplant is not nearly as expensive. So we actually were able to calculate the money that Medicare would save by doing this. Now, we published this in the American Journal of Transplantation, the best journal in our field, clearly read by every single legislative assistant on Capitol Hill, right? Because it's a great journal. They should read this. But they don't read this. They read the Washington Post. They read the New York Times. How do you get the attention of policymakers when you do science? And the way you do it is through patients and through media. And what I mean by patients is not sitting around waiting for somebody to pick up your story. It's introducing reporters to the people you take care of. And the front page, above the fold, New York Times article that reported on this, the first two words of that article were the name of a patient living in LA who was on a waiting list, watching us throw away organs that we could potentially use for him. 
He got the attention of the media. The media tent got the attention of the Hill. So then we went to Capitol Hill. Now, Capitol Hill is not an easy place to navigate. We talked to a lot of people in Congress, and actually the White House has an AIDS strategy office, and we talked to them as well. And one of the things that the White House was shooting for that year was reducing the stigma of HIV. And they said, how are you as transplant surgeons going to reduce the stigma of HIV? And I said, well, every single adult, when they go get their driver's license, has to make a decision. That decision is, are you going to be an organ donor or not? But it's not every single adult. It's every single adult, except the million plus people in this country living with HIV who are told that their organs are worthless and that they can't be organ donors because of this law from the 1980s. AIDS office was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we're with you on this. And they helped us create a policy, I mean, create a strategy for going through Capitol Hill. This is Lois Capps, who was a representative at the time and also a former nurse who was able to talk about the medical issues of this. This was from a uh, congressional briefing that we did, one of the largest attending co congressional briefings that year. How did we get a bunch of LAs to come here a congressional briefing? We fed them, just like we fed you. That's how we got you here as well. <laughs> so with them on our side and with the support of all of these medical, patient, HIV advocacy groups, every single one of them has some advocacy person that works on the Hill. We were able to get enough support. Bill got introduced in February 2013 called the HOPE Act, the HIV Organ Policy Equity Act, brilliantly named by some 23-year-old. Um, <laughs> and Obama signed it in November of 2013. Then we had to percolate all of this through transplant policy and other laws, et cetera, et cetera. By 2016, we were ready to do this, and a donor became available, and we did, at Hopkins, the first HIV to HIV kidney and liver transplants from a deceased donor. And that was huge, and that opened up a lot of things. And now, we have actually funding from the NIH. We've done more than 100 transplants of HIV to HIV um, from deceased donors. And this is something that's growing across the country. We've put together protocols to teach all of our colleagues how to do this. This is a, we're learning interesting things not only about transplantation, but also about HIV virology, like the HIV virus itself, like viral dominance, like super infection, like the viral, the, the latent reservoir where HIV hides. Because we're doing this natural thing where we give somebody one strain of HIV from their donor into somebody who has a different strain of HIV. And we know exactly when it happens and we can get samples and we can study all of that stuff. So first we had the opportunity as transplant surgeons in this very, very small niche of medicine to impact stigma associated with HIV. Now we have the opportunity as transplant surgeons to impact the virology of HIV science and potentially to help cure HIV because of the transplants that we're doing. Barack Obama, um, President Obama in 2016, when we did this first transplant, sent us a very nice letter. We were very happy. And it was a really interesting thing that now all of a sudden Capitol Hill cared about this silly little thing we were doing in transplantation and a demonstration that really in whatever field you're in, you can impact policy and you can get the attention of the, uh, of the big policymakers. But then we wanted to use HIV positive living donors. I got countless emails from people saying, my loved one has HIV and needs a kidney transplant. I have HIV, I wanna donate to them. Can I donate to them? We were worried, and the reason this had never been done before is that HIV itself is associated with HIV-associated nephropathy, high van, or basically kidney injury from the HIV itself. And historically also, the drugs used to control HIV, the antiretrovirals, also had toxicity to the kidney. So historically, this would not have been, this would have been a showstopper for somebody with HIV to donate a kidney because then they're just going to get kidney disease down the road. We studied more than 40,000 people with HIV in a broad-based epidemiology study where we asked today, in the modern era of ART, with well-controlled HIV, what is your risk of getting kidney failure down the road? And it turns out, using some really cool machine learning algorithms, it turns out you can identify a phenotype of person that would be just fine to donate an organ, 
even if they had HIV. And Nina Martinez was one of them. And therein comes good old-fashioned American altruism. Nina Martinez had heard about the first HIV to HIV transplants, wanted to become a kidney donor, was waiting for, for us to do the research. This is somebody who's been living her whole life with HIV, worked for the CDC, understood HIV epidemiology, and said, I want to donate a kidney, and ended up donating a kidney to a stranger. She has not even yet met her recipient. She donated two weeks ago. She said, this is not about me. This is about saving somebody else's life and proving that people with HIV, which used to be a death sentence, can now save people's lives. So moving from what we just did back out to all of you and to everyone you know, thinking about this story and how it impacts them, I wanted to give you some take-home messages, things that we learned, things that hopefully will generalize to everybody listening. First of all, it's really important to remember that today, HIV is not a death sentence. HIV does not look like somebody sick and ready to die. HIV looks like Nina Martinez, a marathon runner who donated her kidney to a stranger. There is a profound organ shortage. I hope that all of you are registered to be organ donors should you one day die, which we all will eventually. <laughs> there are over 100,000 people waiting for an organ, and many of them die every day while waiting. People living with HIV can receive organs and can donate organs. Science can inform policy. I know it seems frustrating, particularly these days, in the political environment, but ultimately, on rare occasion, science can inform policy. Anyone can impact policy. If there is something that is important to you, you can impact policy. Lots of things piss us off, all of us. Pick one and try to fix it. <laughs> Don't let people talk you out of your mission. I cannot tell you how many people said to me, you're out of your mind, no one will ever pass this, you're trying to get a congressional law passed, 50 get passed every year, what makes you think your stupid little cause is gonna be the thing that gets passed? Don't let people talk you out of your mission, and like I tell all the people who work in my research group and all my collaborators, rock on.